much. Wow, I hope I can live up to this introduction. And my husband said, you know, it's like scheduling against the Super Bowl with the Iowa caucuses today. So I can't believe this room is full. And I want to thank you, all of you, each and every one of you, for coming out. I see some familiar student faces, other student faces, and new faces. Um, and I'm really, really pleased and honored that you made the time to uh, come and and listen to my talk, and also to have a, a discussion. I, I very much look forward to that. Um, so just by way of preface, I work at the intersection of the study of international politics and the study of contemporary religion. And so the book that I'm talking about tonight is uh, an attempt, I would say, to bring religious studies and some of the insights from the study of religion into the study of global politics. So that's just kind of by way of a preface. So when you hear the words religion, in world politics or religion and international affairs today, it may bring to mind stories of religious violence and religious persecution. Right now we're saturated with these stories, particularly from the Middle East. We also hear a lot about efforts by Western states to combat religious violence and religious persecution by attempting to secure religious freedom, toleration, moderation. And these voices and these calls have been amplified with the rise of ISIS. So tonight I'm going to suggest that to respond effectively to the world beyond our borders and before we prescribe solutions to the world's many problems, we need to begin by asking new questions about religion and politics and the intersection between them. And specifically we need to understand how do states actually govern religion, both at home and abroad. Tonight I'll be focusing on the abroad piece. And we need to think about how those efforts shape actual religious and political lives. So I'm going to focus on three questions. This is the preview. What on earth is going on? How do we describe what's going on at the intersection of religion and foreign policy today? That's a big question. We'll do it really quickly. How do we think about religion? When you think about religion, you might be thinking about it in one of three ways, and I call these expert religion, official religion, and lived religion. And I'm going to say more about each of these three categories, which are kind of the conceptual backbone to the book. Uh, and I, but I think they'll also be familiar to you. So hopefully you won't be lost in jargon, swimming around trying to get your sense of direction. I think from your own experience, whether you consider yourself religious or you don't, these will be familiar once I start talking about them. Then finally, I'll talk a little bit about how breaking religion down like this changes how we see the world. By the world, I'm talking specifically about questions of religious discrimination, questions of the protection of religious minorities, and the question of religious violence. So how does this change how we think about the world? So what's going on? What on earth is going on? In 2011, Navy Chaplain Lieutenant Commander Nathan Solomon, that's not him in the picture, found himself in an unexpected role. Traditionally, as many of you know, chaplains in the armed services are sent to the field to serve the religious needs of service members and their families. Solomon, however, was put in a new role, a new role that's been assumed in recent years since 2010 officially, uh, which is to serve basically as a counterinsurgent, to do what is called <coughs> religious liaison or religious outreach work. So the chaplains are sent out to the field to establish relationships with local religious leaders. And this is mainly in Iraq and Afghanistan. <coughs> So Solomon and his colleagues in Afghanistan were ordered to find ways to counter the Taliban's message. Solomon, who is not an expert on the Quran, and I met someone last week who's a good friend of his by chance and told me that his training is in Hebrew Bible. Solomon and his Afghan liaison with whom he worked were told, you need to go out and you need to give Quran lessons and you need to give them to the local citizens and then they're going to be taped and they're going to be broadcast on the radio. So they were supposed to invite area elders and mullahs and hold the shura and discuss with local tribesmen to define what was understood to be Islam's true peaceful nature. Also in 2011, also in Afghanistan, the U.S. Marines sent 45 elders and politicians from Helmand province to Amman, Jordan, on what the Marines call a collaborative influence program. This program was called Voices of Religious Tolerance. And what they did is they took them to Amman and took them on tours of mosques and parks and shopping malls in order to learn about life in a religiously tolerant country. 
In the photo you see here, U.S. Marines are paying an Afghan imam funds to pay for repairs to a mosque that was damaged during a U.S. offensive against the Taliban in 2010. What is going on? How does a Navy chaplain end up giving Quran lessons? What about disestablishment? Does the U.S. Constitution apply overseas? The answer is no, it does not. Not really, and it actually never really has. What we have instead, since 9-11, but also before, is a proliferation, a spread of U.S.-sponsored religious interventionism. And that might sound strange and even kind of foreign, but I want us to think about that and think about what it means. My book is an attempt to study those programs and to find a way to talk about them that is outside the terms of the culture wars. So rather than being for or against, let's try to understand what's going on first. So what do I mean by religious interventionism? I mean very specifically U.S. government-led and funded programs and policies and projects to support what is understood to be good religion, moderate religion, temperate religion and also to suppress immoderate, bad, archaic, scary, dangerous, violent, anti-American religion. Now these efforts take a whole lot of different forms, and I won't try to summarize them all. They wear different hats. Some are called promoting religious freedom. Some of them are called interfaith dialogue. Some of them involve lobbying for religious rights protections. But they all became much more fully institutionalized in the state after 9-11 although there are very interesting precedents in the Cold War, which I can't talk about here, but I do in the book and would be happy to discuss later. It was called um, spiritual, some of them, it was a, a question of global spiritual health during the Cold War. Those were the, the terms that were used. The U.S. was promoting global spiritual health in the face of godless communism, of course. Um, so today, many of our allies, uh, many, the U.S. and our allies agree We've kind of got a loose consensus that the flourishing of free religion and protection of religious rights are the basic requirements to free societies from various social ills, and those range from intercommunal violence to gender discrimination to economic privation of various kinds. So in this view, if we can find the right kind of religion, we can recognize it, we can support it, then it will have emancipatory potential. Moderate or good religion will be sort of the treatment the medicine for all of these social and political problems. Good religion will catalyze democratization. It'll take the wind out of the sails of the extremists. And so what we have today is this growing commitment and consensus by states and by international organizations to cultivate this good religion. And we see this not only in the US, but also in the EU and Canada, the UN and other international organizations. I won't focus on them, but if anyone has questions, again, I'd be happy to talk about other cases. So it's interesting to me, one of the reasons I became interested in this topic is I like to study things that everyone agrees on. So one thing that's interesting about this topic is there's really a bipartisan consensus about this issue, and this is something that's often misunderstood by liberals in the U.S. It is not only evangelicals. This is a really big um, kind of machine, I would say, and really a loose consensus. So for example, President Obama speaking at the National Prayer Breakfast in 2014, he said, history shows nations that uphold the rights of their people, including freedom of religion, are ultimately more just, more peaceful, and more successful. Nations that do not uphold these rights sow the bitter seeds of instability, violence, and extremism. Freedom of religion matters to our national security." End quote. So across the political spectrum, from left to right, religiously free states and peoples are said to naturally oppose terrorism, support the free market, and be inclined to democracy. So the government's goal is to create tolerant religious citizens that are believing or non-believing consumers of free religion and practitioners of faith-based solutions. States are committing resources and training bureaucrats today to pursue these objectives. Okay, who cares? Is there any reason that we should be skeptical of this? Is there any reason that, that governments shouldn't maybe work to produce good religion and discipline bad religion? What might this imply for people whose lives are being tailored and shaped, nipped and tucked, to meet this global demand for tolerant subjects who enjoy their freedom under law, as defined by those in positions of both political and religious power? So my book is an attempt, among other things, to try to open up this field of religion and governance 
and think about how we can ask and answer these questions um, differently. Uh, that gives us a little more reach past that consensus. So I want to just introduce these three concepts of religion to help us sort of explore these questions, open up this field, and see where it leads us. And again, it's not necessarily being for or against these projects and policies. It's how do I think critically about them? What, where do I start to ask intelligent questions about what's going on around us in this field? And I'll get to some examples near the end. So with that expert religion, religion is defined by people who generate policy-relevant knowledge. This is a really big thing in political science. The demand right now, if you want to get a grant, if you want to do research, is your research needs to be policy-relevant. You better have something to say to the world. So scholars, policy experts, pundits, and talking heads, when they're talking about religion, I hear the same refrain over and over again. And that is, it's either celebrated as a source of morality, a source of community, a source of cohesion, or it's warned against as a potential danger. Watch out, it needs to be contained, it needs to be reformed, we need to be careful. And you've probably heard many different versions of both of these narratives. This is how many experts talk about religion today. It's not the only way. And this brings us to the second category that I introduced, which is lived religion. You can think of lived religion in really simple terms as religion as practiced by ordinary people, everyday people, as they interact with various authorities, rituals, texts, and institutions, maybe from one tradition, maybe from several, as they seek to make sense of their lives, as they seek to connect to others or find their place in the world. You might think of lived religion as small r religion, in contrast to the big R of expert, legal religion. Some people say that small r religion is a nearly ubiquitous and arguably necessary part of human culture. Big R religion, the religion that's protected in constitutions, the religion that's in human rights law, the religion that's in liberal political theory. Big R religion is a modern invention. It's a tool of governance, the big R religion religion of the state. So we can catch a very small glimpse here of the, distinct, the distinction between expert religion and lived or small r religion, the kind you may run into every day in all kinds of settings, both expected and not. And this brings us to the last category of official religion. Religion is defined for purposes of law, purposes of government. And here I want you to just think about the law for a moment. Law is an important source of expert religion. State law is what I'm talking about. So who decides what counts as religion and what doesn't? And I'll give you one quick example from a European case, which I found interesting. And in this recent European case, the court was debating whether a crucifix hanging on the wall behind an Italian <coughs> elementary public school teacher was an exercise of religious freedom or a violation of religious freedom. Now, the crucifix is mandated by the state to hang there. It's not that the teacher chose it, and it must hang directly behind him or could it be both? Could it be both an exercise of freedom and an instance of its violation? The EU debated this question for years. This was called the Lautzi case. And in the end, the court, after several appeals, concluded that the crucifix is not, in fact, an active religious symbol. Rather, it is a passive symbol of Italian cultural heritage. Some celebrated this decision. Others were appalled. It broke down along extremely interesting lines. It's really an interesting story to tell people because you can you never know what how they're going to respond. Again, to me, what's interesting is not to be appalled or to celebrate these decisions, but the fact that the judges and courts are making these decisions. This is official religion. The religion is construed by law, and it's extremely influential in shaping how people's lives are lived and how they understand themselves in relation to these categories. So, when a court or a government official hands down a ruling like the Laozi ruling about what is or isn't religious or cultural, this is a political, legal, and theological decision. It's all of them together. So throw your understandings of secularism, as Brian said, out the window, or at least set them on the ledge and, and look at them once in a while, but don't take them too seriously. So it's all, with, all at the same time. And it may actually, in many cases, these decisions will conflict with how ordinary people experience their religion, or it may align with it, and they may feel vindicated. That wasn't the case for many Catholics in the wake of that decision, I can tell you that, to say that the crucifix is not religious. But the point is, you can't just talk about religion in political and legal context in a generic sense. 
we have to look at very specific cases. We have to understand how religion is understood, how it's construed, how it's defined by whom and to what ends. So then we can ask, whose religion has returned to global politics? What's going on? What if we were to consider the gap between religion as construed by the states, by the courts, by liberal political theorists, by experts, and religion as it's lived and experienced by people on the ground? How does this change how we think about global politics? Here I'm going to have to be brief um, for reasons of time, but let me just give you a couple of examples. The first is efforts to protect groups as religious minorities, and the second is religious violence. So first of all, what happens when the U.S. and the international community go out to legally define and protect individuals, communities, or traditions as religions? And again, this is going to be big R religion. On the international stage today, you probably hear about this all the time, individuals and groups are being compelled to represent themselves and their practices and their communities and their traditions and their identities as recognizably religious. They have to do this in order to access international aid, in order to get asylum, in order to get legal protection. There are strong material incentives that follow from big R religion, from the incentive to identify oneself and others in this religious register. So of course people in groups comply, this is normal. And what this means is that faith communities are starting to take shape as corporate bodies, public corporate bodies internationally, in order to reap the benefits of being classified as religions, as faith communities, as persecuted religionists. So in other words, global politics is shaping religion. An example are refugees from Sudan. Sudanese refugees in Egypt, interviewed by my colleague Melanie McAllister, told Melanie that, quote, being a persecuted Christian was a good thing if you wanted to get asylum status or help from UN programs, end quote. Now, the same is occurring all over the world today. Right now, I see it in claims for asylum in Germany in the context of the current refugee crisis. Because asylum claims coming from Pakistani Christians carry more weight legally and politically in Germany, there's been an uptick in conversions to Christianity among asylum seekers and a great deal of anxiety about whether these are authentic not authentic. All the people are pulling their hair out. Again, the point isn't to judge these individuals. You have to do what you have to do to survive. It's that both politics and religion are being mutually transformed in ways that can't be fully disentangled through the promotion of official protections for these groups as religious minorities. And in this case, those who cannot or who choose not to identify in this way are less likely to be protected. They fall between the cracks. They're unseen. It's not a conspiracy. It's just that they become invisible. They become illegible to this regime of governance. This is one of the things that my book is concerned to um, sort of bring to the surface. So does this mean that privileging religious groups legally is inherently discriminatory? In many ways, it does. Shock. I'm saying that the First Amendment is discriminatory, right? This is what I'm saying. It is discriminatory. It is a form of religious discrimination, our own First Amendment. The religion that gets privileged through legal guarantees for religious rights can never align perfectly with the diverse forms of belonging, belief, and practice on the ground, with what I'm calling lived religion. As one scholar of Brazilian religion described the scene in Brazil, she said, quote, it's unsurprising to meet a Brazilian who calls herself Catholic, belonged to an evangelical youth group as a teenager, was married by a priest, attends a local Methodist church, reads spiritist books, draws mandalas to relax, and consults an Umbanda priest for advice." End quote. This is actually the religion of much of the world. It's been chronicled by observers everywhere, though it's largely invisible in the big R religion world bit of political science. Whether we're talking about Brazil, Japan, Morocco, Spain, or even the US, it can be very difficult to classify some people simply as a believer or a non-believer. So we need to ask, how do these realities, these religious realities on the ground, relate to efforts to secure something called international religious freedom? When we legalize religious freedom, we have to define religion, and we have to define freedom. Dissidents, doubters, those who identify with mixed traditions, with many traditions, or with non-orthodox traditions, or with politically disfavored traditions, all struggle for air on a faith-based landscape that privileges authorized religions and their official representatives. 
Last example, what do we do with this category of religious violence? Religious violence is something we hear about almost every day. You can't really turn on, well, I'm an NPR addict, so you can't turn on NPR. You can't pick up the paper without hearing about it. Syria, Iraq, Central African Republic, Myanmar, religious violence is everywhere. There was a new journal in my field, and the inaugural statement of the journal said, there is widespread religious conflict in modern politics. What if we were to turn this around and think about it differently? When we talk of something called religious violence, we declare religion to be the cause of violence. It's violence caused by religion, religious violence. Our explanation for the violence becomes, those people are doing this because they're religious, and they don't like other religions, or maybe they don't like other versions of their religion. When we say this, we become immediately incapable of seeing the broader institutionalized, often racialized, and politicized context in which discrimination and violence actually occur. Religion is, of course, part of this picture. Nobody's off the hook here. But a broader lens reveals that these racialized, nationalist, religionized politics are often intertwined in messy combinations that can't simply be pulled apart. You pull one thread, the whole thing falls apart. And here I'm going to give, conclude actually, with a longer example, which is um, from the Rohingya people of Myanmar, who we've been hearing a fair amount uh, about in the news lately. This is a population of about 800,000 people. They live in northwestern Myanmar, which used to be called Burma. The Rohingya are described by most of the media today and by the U.S. government, particularly the religious freedom lobbies, as a persecuted religious minority suffering from religious violence at the hands of an intolerant Buddhist majority. There is an element of truth. There's a grain of truth to that. There is absolutely no doubt that they are being persecuted, that they are vulnerable, and that they are being mistreated. So to put that of them to be very clear, since 1982, the Burmese state has denied them citizenship, though most Rohingya have lived in Burma for many centuries. The name of the government crackdowns that have taken place speak for themselves. Operation Dragon King in 1978, and my own favorite, Operation Clean and Beautiful Nation in 1991. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands were forced out, mostly to Bangladesh. Today, the Rohingya are being persecuted by the state, by nationalist Buddhist monks, and by many others. Some in the international community are starting to use the language of a genocide. It appears that very little is going to change, sadly, with the recent victory of the National League for Democracy this past November. The NLD, as you probably know, will control the next parliament, I believe it's been seated within the last few days, and can choose the next president of Myanmar. But when asked about the fate of the Rohingya, a senior party leader, said the government has, quote, other priorities. How should we think about the role of religion, religious identity, and religious difference in this case? So religious difference, as I said, bears a very heavy explanatory load in accounts of the Rohingya's persecution. We're told the people of Myanmar are intolerant. The problem is they're incompletely secularized in the sense that intolerant and violent forms of religion stubbornly persist in public life. We're over that. We had our problem in Europe 500 years ago. We figured it out. Bad religion causes persecution and violence. We need to show them how to be good religious people. We're going to bring them good religion. We're going to bring them legal guarantees for minorities. And we're going to bring them freedom. But it's possible to tell a very different story about what's going on, and that's the story that interests me. In Myanmar, patterns of authority, sociability, and state power that do not cleanly distinguish between the economic, political, and religious domains are all working together as one to exclude the Rohingya from Burmese state and society. In other words, the discrimination against them simply cannot be reduced to religion. It's just not really only religious, it's ethnic, racial, economic, political, colonial, and historical. So each of those factors is deeply entangled with religious authorities, histories, institutions, and traditions in complex formations that anthropologists have shown us to be the case, but none can be reduced to them. So if we focus on religious difference as the problem and religious freedom as the solution, we're blinded to these various economic, political, historical forces that are all complicit in the marginalization of these people. It also blinds us, crucially, to the possibility of critiquing the state. 
So when the media, when the advocacy groups, when the religious freedom lobby come together to describe the Rohingya as persecuted Muslims, they distract us from these other dimensions of the Rohingya's exclusion. They displace them. But they do something else that's actually much more dangerous politically. They play it directly into the hand of an exclusionary form of nationalism that's thriving today in Myanmar. This is a form of nationalism that itself relies on a strict hierarchy of religious difference that is public, with Buddhists on top and Muslims at the bottom or cast out entirely. The Buddhist monks organization, 969, is an example of this view. You can Google them and find out their, their positions. Basically, they've called for the ethnic and religious cleansing of the Rohingya from, from Burma. So 969 and its allies relies on hard and fast lines separating Muslims at the bottom from Buddhists on top, authentic Burmese citizens from imposters. It's all mixed together. They need these strong connections between particular interpretations of Buddhism, race, and the Burmese nation. How do we subvert this narrative from the outside? I think we need to ask, are the Rohingya being persecuted because they're Muslim, because they're seen as outsiders, as immigrants, or because they're seen as threatening the economic interests of the former Burmese junta, which remains extraordinarily powerful, even despite the elections that just happened? Could it be all of the above? I think the former junta may be quietly supporting the religious persecution narrative in order to distract from their own complicity in casting out the Rohingya. And I think the same may hold for Suu Kyi's party, the NLD. So the moral of the story that I'm telling is that when we describe the Rohingya's plight as a problem of religious violence, we force a much bigger and more complex story into a limited space, a limited interpretive space, that, which is itself defined by distinctions between religions. So we reproduce the very problem we're trying to treat, right? This makes it harder for us to see what's going on. But it also feeds the fire of those who profit politically from those distinctions. We stabilize and we strengthen the very lines of religious difference that we seek to transcend. So Muslim Buddhist difference in Burma becomes the axis around which all public discussion and debate turns. It's all we can see, it's all we can talk about. And rather than alleviating polarization along these sectarian lines, we energize it leading to new and exclu exclusionary forms of both politics and religion. The political effects are real. The new parliament, which was seated last week, has no Muslim members for the first time since Burmese independence in 1948. One NLD leader interviewed by the Times said, my party chose not to field any Muslim candidates because that would have given ammunition to the radical Buddhists. This is a very complex situation and I think we need to think more carefully about how to respond. So I'm gonna wrap up by just saying, that I think in Burma, in Myanmar, and elsewhere, we need to take this integrative understanding of religion, politics, and society, and bring it that as an interpretive lens to understand the conflicts that we see around us. We need to see religion as already always part of politics and history, rather than standing apart from it. We also need to consider that legalizing religious difference may be a very dangerous game. There's often no agreement within any tradition on who speaks on behalf of the tradition, who is in, who is out, which texts and practices represent the core of that tradition, and so on. There is no such thing as a single and fixed Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Christianity. There are porous and shifting lines between believers and non-believers, between orthodox and dissent, between the world of the sacred and the world of the everyday. So when these categories of religious and non-religious are put to work in law and in politics, in the media, those experts who are talking on the later news hour, those in positions of power are drawing those lines, they're determining who's in and who's out, and they're authorizing particular traditions and marginalizing others. All right, thank you. Look forward to the discussion.